and we're really excited about all the opportunities in front of us and what we can get working with you guys. Um, I'm here with my colleagues Ron and Inga and Faye this afternoon um, and what we'd like to do is spend some time talking to you about a little bit about the project background and where we came from um, and how we came to be an Imperio project. Um, and that's going to take me about 10 minutes to do that. And I'm going to hand over to Ron, who's going to give you a demo through the software and a sort of an introduction to um, how it works and what it can do. We won't have time to talk about everything, um, but we should be able to give you a fairly broad broad idea. Faye's then going to pick up on some of the um, developments that, are, that we're working on at the moment, some of the new templates. Um, and Inga's going to talk a little bit about the, um, the Zerti community and the Zerti community website, and um, that's that side of things. Um, we're also going to be at the conference in Baltimore um, and we're running a couple of workshops on Sunday that we're not going to charge for and again it's just a really good opportunity for us to um, introduce ourselves to you guys, give you an opportunity to come spend some time with us um, and talk about what the tools can do and some of the opportunities that we think um, are unique to it. Um, so just to speak a little bit about the background of the project, the, the project really began in 2004 when I joined um, the University of Nottingham. I've been an authorware developer beforehand, and I really liked that sort of um, icon-driven flow line um, approach to putting content together. Um, and what was clear to me at that point was that authorware wasn't going to work on the web; and it didn't work very well. Um, and Flash had a Flash at that point was the, the, the tool to use, but for a lot of developers, and especially in education, um, writing there was a lot of code to write to make that happen. Um, so when I first took over managing the team that I manage here at the university, um, in, the, in the course of a year they might work together on about 20 projects or something like that. Um, and they were building all of the projects from scratch. So they were starting again with a new interface and a, you know, a new navigation system. And there was a lot of time spent in resolving problems. And what we set about to do with the Zerti project um, was to build a whole load of reusable solutions so that we could make, make use of those on, on projects time and again. We've also put a lot of emphasis onto accessibility um, because that's a problem that product developers still grapple with and some of the solutions to that are not obvious. Um, and so we wanted to provide the very best accessibility support that we could. Um, this was all built into a flash engine I suppose is the way to think about it. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to separate the content from the runtime technology because what was clear to me at that stage was that a lot of developer teams were, have, were left with a lot of authorware content that they hoped they couldn't do anything with because it wouldn't run on the web. And so we separated the content as an, in, a, in an XML format that could describe a rich interactive resource um, as well as and the, or separated from the actual runtime engine which would take those XML files and play them. Um, and that was a good promise to the university because we said we were going to future-proof the content and what we've been able to do in fact is to move content from those very early days right the way through to an HTML5 runtime now. Um, so that's where we started off. We started off with some very crude tools that we were using within the team ourselves and we started to work on a, an editor and we gave the tools away free for the first time in 2006. And what we've said was that these tools are really easy to use if you write some code and um, you, you know a little bit about that sort of that side of things. And what we discovered was that the community very much heard that these tools are easy to use and they didn't hear so much that if you write code. <clears throat> it came as a real surprise to me to find that very few people in the learning technology community in higher education were coders. Most people working as learning technologists don't write a lot of code themselves, aren't necessarily developers, and they were finding it very difficult to engage with our tools, despite the fact that we thought they were easy to use and it made develop, development really fast. And so over the next couple of years, um, I started to work with Ron and with TechDis, and what we started to do was build another layer on top of the tools to hide all of the technology so that you didn't have to write code to put content together. And that was the first suite of templates. Um, when the, the application at that point was reasonably mature, it was a Windows application. It still meant that some users had difficulties getting files from their desktop where they were working on projects and publishing them online somewhere where they could be accessed by learners. And that sort of remained a challenge. So the idea then became, and this is I suppose the third iteration of the tools, was to move away from a Windows application altogether 
um, and to move all of the tools into the browser, which would give us so many advantages. It would let people collaborate on projects together, um, for example, and it would mean that the technology could re remain completely hidden to the people that didn't need to see it. Um, and so we worked on that from 2008 till 2010. Um, the world was very different by that point to, when, to, to, to the world of 2004 when we started out, and particularly in terms of bandwidth. When we, when we first started out, we were worried about a 60K runtime, and, and, and compared to the bandwidth that's available today, 60K is just trivial um, <clears throat> amount of stuff. And also, the bandwidth was there to allow people to use a web-based tool and to be able to upload, upload video and sound files and so on, which would have been difficult for people working on a modem you know, just four years previously. And so we released that in um, 2000, and we first introduced it at the University of Nottingham in 2008, and, and we worked on it until pretty much, I suppose, until 2010, getting it ready for the first release to the public. And that's where we started to get a lot of traction. We started to really grow the community. And I think by that point, we realized that we were onto something by targeting non-technical users. We've always said that we still wanted the tools to be useful to developers and, and that, it, that whilst it should make simple things simple, it should make anything possible. So we want to allow developers to build in more powerful templates and um, functionality to the tools, but also to leave that hidden to the to less technical people who just want to author content. So over the last couple of years, what we've really seen is our community grow. Um, I know somebody asked in the questions about how many institutions are using Xerti. We don't know the answer to that accurately, but we have identified over 130. Um, that's just from the English speaking world, people that we've been able to identify ourselves through um, just look, looking online for people that are talking about it. So I also know that there are a number of people in, uh, using it in Japanese, in Spanish, and in some other languages where it's not so easy for us to just find stuff online. Um, so it's probably many more than that. Um, over those years as well, our developer community really began to grow. So we have about a dozen committers and people that are actively contributing to the project. And by the end of 2012, at the University of Nottingham, we were really starting to wonder about sustainability and how this project was going to sustain itself into the future. We knew it was successful and we really wanted it to remain successful. Um, and we started to think about all of the different options that we had in terms of sustainability. So should we commercialize the software and run it as software as a service or something like that? Or should we even think about selling it? Um, or what, other, what other commercial options might there be? Should we carry on as we were? Um, or should we think about foundations and donating the software to something like Apache, which we knew about, or Aperio, which we didn't at that time know about? Um, we went through all the all the options, and we really settled on the on the foundation idea as being the best fit for for us and for our community. Um, and given that the more work was being done by people that didn't work at the University of Nottingham by this stage, and people who did, then we didn't think that it would be fair to to take all of that effort and then suddenly commercialise it and spin it out into something that was going to make money for the university, for example. That just didn't, didn't feel right. So we started to look um, closely at the different foundations to find out what was out there and who we might be able to engage with. I spent quite a lot of time lurking on the Apache lists. Apache was a real candidate for a while, but we just, I decided that the Apache community is really vibrant, which is great, but it's really, it's really full of Java middleware developers, and they don't have so much um, in common with us. And so whilst it's got a very credible very active community of people working around the Apache stuff. Um, I wasn't sure what what um, we would gain from working with them. Whereas Apirio really stood out as being a community of higher education projects, and we would have opportunities for real synergy with some of the other projects in Apirio. So that was a proposal that was put forward, um, and it was accepted by the senior people here at the university. And in September last year, and we've been talking to Ian for a number of months and we began the incubation process. We're very nearly through that now. Um, we have done all the bureaucratic side of it and all of, all of the um, IP and all of that sort of stuff is attended to. 
what we need to do is to finish our work on the next release and put that out there, um, which we aim to do before we come over to the US in June to the Baltimore, to the conference at Baltimore. And I'm pretty certain that once we get that release out there, then I think we've all agreed to that, that we've pretty much completed the, the, the incubation process. So um, that's a really short history of the project and about where we've come from and about how we ended up as an Imperio, uh, as an Imperio project. We're really excited about the opportunity. This is a really great opportunity for us to grow our community of users and developers, particularly in the US where we don't have so many users. This is a great opportunity to come and introduce ourselves to you. So thanks very much for stopping in this afternoon. I hope to meet some of you personally in Baltimore in June. And I'm going to hand over to Ron now, who's going to take you through the software a little bit and give you a very brief introduction to some of the functionality. So thanks very much. Thanks, Julian. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. We tested um, our access to the Google button earlier, but um, I'm seeing a bit of a, a web, web RTC audio kind of exclamation message. So. Um, be good if someone can confirm that you can hear me okay. Um, the screenshots that I was switching to um, in, the, in the text page um, is actually a, a live learning object that we um, created for the Aperio conference or the ESUP conference in Paris. Um, and I'm going to put a link to that in the text chat now so that you can all follow along with um, the various pages we've put in there and that that provides you know much more in-depth information that we can cover during this um, short webinar and um, what I'm going to try to do now is share my screen and, and actually display that learning object live so hopefully that's going to work um, I did test in advance um, bear with me just a second Okay, taking a bit of a while to load up. Okay, so okay, so it looks looks as though that's working okay. Um. The main section I wanted to just quickly um, go through, particularly if um, people are particularly um, new to Xerti, as I think most of you are, is um, how does Xerti Online Toolkits work and what it can do for you and why you should care. Um, so first little section here, which hopefully you're seeing, is usually during a, a webinar or during a, a training session is something we skip past because um, it's kind of not the, the domain of the delegates but hopefully this um, is more useful to you in terms of how do you get it, where do you get it, um, how do you uh, use it to your online toolkits. Well, true to the Imperio community and as Julian outlined, it's free and open source. We have the source code on GitHub and we have downloads on the community site. We pre prefer just to download a, a zip file and install it. And of course, it's a web server application, so simply needs Apache and MySQL to, to run. So we'll skip past that, but there's some links in the top of this How and Why page that um, will tell you more, including recordings of screencasts, um, talking you through installation, and obviously we have documentation on installation as well within the download. Um, there's a in this page is a link to an interactive simulation. So if you want to um, explore the way Xerti works and can't quickly get an installation up and running, um, there's a kind of an interactive simulation there, which you can see the little kind of red um, hover buttons. If you click on those or hover over those, they'll give you explanations of um, what the various project templates and, and what the various buttons and things do. So it's kind of a, it's a bit of old branding, so it looks a bit out, out of date now and is, isn't the current um, style that we have. 
but it's a, a quick way that you could kind of explore some of the things and hopefully we're going to look at some of that live shortly too. Um, a quick key point that um, I think Julian touched on is that we have a, an ethos of um, making Xerti incredibly easy for anybody to use. So if you're talking about an educational institution, basically potentially all staff and all students and we have this kind of anecdote that you'll you'll see in various online videos and other people mention that if you can shop online you can use the T online toolkits. Um, we'll switch to a live demo shortly but um, I'm going to try playing this video and, and hopefully it will kind of play in a reasonable speed. Um, actually it looks as though it's probably not so I'm going to stop that. Um, you can you can view that um, video from the, the link that you've already got to the learning object and we'll switch to a, a live demo shortly. Um, so it is offering for everybody um, and it's equally powerful for specialists because um, you can use the same tool as your um, teachers and, and learners will use to offer content. And you can dedicate your skills, your specialist skills, to more specialist content. So it really is a tool for everybody. And unlike you know, various proprietary tools, offering tools that actually take quite a long time to learn and are expensive to have, you know, for instance, a site license, the good thing about Xerti being free and open source is you can have it on the server. Anyone can use it. And you know, for instance, if a, a tutor wanted a, a paragraph of text changed, they can do that themselves and you can reserve your time for the more specialist skills and, and perhaps the more advanced um, development side of things. We have lots of examples linked in here and, and online elsewhere that we'll point you to. Um, and certainly in the UK and I think elsewhere as well, there are lots of example projects now and case studies where it's actually students using the tool to create um, interactive content. Um, in a far more engaging and, um, and professional way, perhaps, than your typical um, slide share and PowerPoint type presentations because of all the interactivity that's possible. We often hear this kind of notion that um, I'm an experienced developer, I prefer XYZ. And you may have, uh, amongst your attending today, you may have your own preferences. There's there's nothing wrong with that. That's very predictable, and and all of us in the Xerti community, developer community, use other tools as well. The point is that you can use those tools together with Xerti, and Xerti really becomes a, an assembly tool, a, a collation tool, um, because you know, for instance, lots of assets, video, audio, images, you're going to create outside of the tool anyway. Um, so if you use other interactive tools, you can easily embed that content and we'll, we'll point you to examples of how you can do that. So for those that do kind of prefer other tools, um, what you've really got to hold on to is this is the tool for all staff and all learners and, and everybody in the organisation. Um, we used to have um, the, the flash only playback. Um, these days we have by default HTML5 playback, which means it really is and, and practically and in reality um, all for one to use anywhere. And, and the template we're looking at now, and hopefully you're following in the, in the link, um, is based on the Twitter Bootstrap library. You don't have to know anything about that as an author. All you do is populate the form fields that you'll see. Um, but of course, what you get is the benefit of the responsive layout and, and design that's all built into that. So um, if you resize the, the template you're viewing or if you try that same link on a mobile device, you see the way that that particular site or bootstrap template works. Um, we have a couple of demonstrators. So what we're viewing here is an overview resource that we put together, as I said, for the, the Paris um, conference um, and we have a link to this resource here but you've already got that in the text chat. We also have these two um, what I usually refer to as the technical demonstrators and if I um, just 
just put that link in text chat. Uh, let's see if I open that link up. Um, we have two main project templates, the, the Zerti Online Toolkit template and this bootstrap template that we're, we're actually looking at now. Um, so, I don't know why that didn't work, let's just open that up again. Okay, so in the text chat, I'm going to put um, a link to our interactive project technical demonstrator. Um, which you'll see on my screen as well and, and that at the moment shows that there's something like 56 different page types we have in the template Now that will be um, slightly less in the, the version that we're about to release or will soon release because actually a lot of those page types were needed for the old flash player and um, almost become redundant to the, the new page types but the new project, but you'll find that um, as you go through and you get automatically get um, a table of contents where the real kind of power and speed and productivity um, lies is the speed in which you can add all these interactive pages and, and so we'll leave you to to explore those but even for people that have used Xerti for many years these technical demonstrators who are referring to them become very useful reminder of the various page types that we have when you're thinking about the teaching and learning aim or objective you're trying to achieve and how that kind of is best presented to the learner in terms of the interactions available and the, and the various navigators and media pages that we have. So there's quite a lot in that template for you to explore. It's not necessarily the best teaching and learning example but it provides a, a very good reference point for the, the page types we have and the types of interactivity and the types of media that can be used. Um, we also have uh, the equivalent for the bootstrap or site template and I'll put the link to that in the text chat as well. So there we go. So that, there's the two technical demonstrators there, the XOT project template and the site or bootstrap project template. What I'll just quickly switch to is um, my installation of Zerti Online Toolkits. Now this is the, um, the beta version of, of the code we're working on now and, and getting um, ready to release. Um, so we have a slightly different styling, it's now fill in the window and the way that you create a project, hopefully this will uh, work in a reasonable fashion, is you click the create button, um, give it a name, click create and what we now have pop up is a HTML5 editor rather than the older flash editor that we had in previous versions. Um, and what you're presented with as an author is various form fields based on the, the page type that you're looking to add. So if I click on insert text and title page, see I can choose where, where to put it. I'll just add it in there. And we have um, the title page to populate. So we can add some type of text there and add some text here. Um, so, not anything particular um, impressive about that, I suppose, but if we look at, for instance, the graphic sound page, um, add that, and then we can browse for an image. Scroll down and select any image. And if I play that now, we should see 
is the beginnings of a learning object that has all the, the kind of default navigation built in. There's our title page, click next. And then we have the, the graphics and sound page. Um, now I mentioned that this is the newer version um, and some of the page types will become, um, there will be fewer page types and the, the older page types will become redundant. We used to have, or still have, this text, plain text page. Um, and I've spent many years delivering training on Xerti and would often kind of say to people, you, know, that you really want to add images to your pages, so you, you know, the, the, the plain text page has a purpose, but you, know, you should probably steer clear of that. Um, but now with the new version that um, we've all been working on, and particularly uh, Tom, uh, as part of the development team and John from University of Glasgow um, and all of us really, um, we now have the WYSIWYG functionality that you'll be used to seeing in other tools. And so effectively you can browse and add multiple images to any page. So in a way the plain text page becomes the most useful because you have then full control rather than the, the kind of pre-built built layouts that we had uh, when we only had the the plain text editor and um, used to deliver via the flash player. Um, so an awful lot of functionality will be available just by having that WYSIWYG editor now as part of the, the tool. I switch back to our um, presentation results. Just quickly scroll, scroll down. Um, I think Ian mentioned already that accessibility, and Julie mentioned that accessibility has been a key part of the development from the beginning. Um, and if you are in the in the area of comparing Xerti when you look at it with other tools, um, bear this in mind and, and truly test the accessibility of the tools that you currently use um, in comparison with Xerti. Um, we have links here to um, accessibility guides for both students and tutors um, and you'll you'll find this um, you know a large and really powerful aspect of Xerti in terms of um, it truly is flexible accessible and lots of um, lots of accessibility benefits for instance all of the drag and drop interactions um, are keyboard accessible um, all of the controls are exposed correctly to screen reader users and so on. Um, but also not just those extremes, all the text is, for instance, selectable. So I can, um, this is a screenshot here, but I can select the text and, for instance, paste that into a text-to-speech engine if I wanted to hear that being read out and if the, the author of the resource hadn't included audio narration as part of um, what they built. Another powerful aspect of this is the built-in collaboration, which again has been there um, from the very beginning, um, where um, this resource that we're looking at is a prime example, where um, you can put faces to the names here, if you like, that Tom, Julian, myself, and Inga all worked on this resource collaboratively in advance of the Paris um, conference. Um, we populated different pages, um, worked on different aspects of it, obviously li liaising um, via email and that kind of thing in readiness for, for delivering that. And that's all built into the tool. There's also many other aspects of, of sharing, for instance, giving projects pre-populated with content and that kind of thing. Um, instant sharing, you're offering online, so there's no need for you know, upload and uh, or creating offline and then uploading somewhere, you can you can do that automatically. But of course, we do have various ex export formats, including school and that kind of thing. Um, lots of interactivity. So here's a, a, one of the Xerti Online Toolkit template projects embedded in the Bootstrap template. So you can use those two together. Um, I'm not dragging these in the correct order, but you can see the way this works. You check your answers and you get. Um, and I only got two out of six correctly. Now, export and import, there's lots of detail included here um, that you can browse in your own time. We do have 
school match ball and although Tim Can is not listed there, I know Tom is, is keen to um, have a solution added to that in due course. And the biggest barrier, in fact, is not the adding that functionality, is how we then communicate with um, the learning record store and that kind of thing. Lots of other aspects to it, like RSS syndication and true repurposing, in as far as what you share can easily be imported into somebody else's Zerting Online Toolkits installation so they can either tweak it, make it their own, or create derivative content and share that back. And that's certainly something we'd be looking to foster and facilitate and encourage as part of the wider Aperio community. We already have um, very active academic as well as technical communities, and hopefully um, through the incubation and, and out the other side, we'll, we'll increase that any more, even more. And we're looking forward as Julian mentioned, to, to meeting, discussing those kind of potentials and affordances with um, people at the Baltimore Conference. A few final points from me, if you still don't care, you know, if you do think we look deserty, um, but our staff wouldn't get on with it, what we'd say really is just give it a try, and particularly with students, uh, some fantastic outputs from student projects. If you prefer other tools, Again, no problem. You can use those other tools together with, with Xerti. Um, and if you already have other tools, that's fine. But Xerti just becomes part of the toolkit. Um, pardon the pun. So really, it's you know because it's free and open source, and there's plenty of resources out there. It really becomes obvious that if you have the wherewithal to get an installation, you should do so. And if all else fails, there is external support and external hosting available if, if, that's, um, if that's the first step you need to take. I'm going to stop waffling on there and pass over to Faye, I believe, um, and then I'll read through any questions that were um, part of the, the chat while I was presenting. Hi, um, I was just going to talk about um, some of the new developments with the templates. Um, so, two new templates have been developed recently. And um, the first one, I'll just share my screen with you actually, just a sec. Been quite slow, so I'll start talking about it then while we're waiting. Um, the um, first template um, is um, called the decision tree template. It starts off from the um, Environment, uh, Environment Technology Centre in Nottingham, um, and they had their. Oh, I think the screen share is working. Okay. Um, so you should be able to see um, what this template looks like. It's actually a complete uh, a template, template like the bootstrap template. So it's not just a page type. So you'll see it here in the workspace decision tree template. Um, this started off um, as um, a big. The idea behind it was that they had a big um, folder of paperwork that engineers went out to try and solve environmental problems. And at the beginning of this huge pile of paper was a quite complicated flowchart. Um, and they would have to answer each question, it would lead one to other questions or some information. And finally, they had to get to a solution um, of how that environmental problem could possibly be solved. Um, and now that they all had mobile devices, iPads and things, it didn't seem like a great idea for them to have carry around a big folder of paperwork and um, so they wanted some way of having um, a online version of this flowchart. They already had all the 
solution information on their website. So it was just a flowchart that they needed um, to um, have an online version. So um, I'll just go through this and you'll have an idea of how it works. So it just poses questions in order. And as you answer them, it takes you to the next relevant question. There are different types of questions. So here, this is multiple choice. There are also questions, these slider questions you can have. And then depending on the answer you give, it takes you to your solution. And um, you can then view an overview of the problem you've just solved. So it gives you all the questions you've answered, the answers you gave, and the solution. You can also view more information and you're given the option to print or email the details of the problem you've just solved. Um, so, as I said, this is a template in its own right, but we also thought it would be useful as a page type in main toolkits template, which is what Ron's just show, shown you. So there's a simplified version of it here. Um, so it's in the normal interface, so it's just a page type you add. And you can see the overview again. And so that's the decision tree template. The other new uh, one we've been working on is called the media lesson template. Oh, it's a page type, sorry. And um, this is going to be a little bit trickier to show you because as Ron showed, the videos don't really work on this screen share very well. Um, but the idea behind this um, was that we wanted a more flexible way of syncing content to a piece of media. So um, in Toolkits, there's already ways of doing an audio slideshow, for example, so you'd have a piece of audio and um, images would come up at particular points when you played the audio file. Um, but we wanted something that you could sync lots of different types of content to um, and set it up so you could pause it at particular points or pose a question and it would, depending on the answer you gave, it would jump you to a different part of the... Uh, I'll sh share the link to this because I don't think it's worth me probably playing it if it's not go if it's going to be really jumpy. Share it on the chat um, thing. So, both of these templates are new and will be in the uh, new release um, that we're aiming for at the end of May, I think, that Ron was talking about. I'll share a link to that second project. As Ron said about some of his examples, it's not um, great teaching and learning content. It just gives you an idea of what that template can do. Um, and if you play the video in it, you'll see different content here in uh, the panel here. Um, and it will pause it at different points so you can explore the content more. Um, it's just a nice, flexible way of uh, getting the media more involved with the rest of the content that's on the page. Um, that's it for me. I think it's over to Inga now to talk about community. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> um, we have a very uh, uh, live community uh, connecting to, to 30. And I'm, my name is Inge Donkervoort and I was uh, uh, connected to the 30 project in 2009 and um, uh, still uh, in because I really love it. And I use it a lot uh, in schools and organizations to create content and especially to create content together. Yesterday I was on a university that uh, just started uh, to create content and they told me that uh, the best thing they um, get together with Xerti was that they created um, learning objects together and at first they thought it was 
um, difficult to work together, but it was really easy and they had really lovely um, learning objects together. So that was the greatest benefit they thought. The community is uh, growing rapidly. In 2012, we started with a community website um, and um, there were um, more users outside um, the UK um, starting to get involved. And at the moment, we have on the community website uh, 2,500 uh, uh, members and 1,700 are active forum users and asking questions and answering them. We have um, a, a stable version, um, the 32 Point one, and that's downloaded 2,000 times um, since it was put up there. And we have an unstable version, that's the new um, editor we are talking about, and that's downloaded already 450 times since uh, April last, last year. And um, we hope to get it uh, stable uh, on the end of May before the Baltimore conference. Um, the active community members are um, in the forum, but we also have a mailing list where you can join and we have a GitHub for the developers. Um, and we are always uh, looking for people who can help out. Only if, um, if you can do small things, you are uh, welcome. And if you can develop, you're welcome. Everybody is welcome and can do something. I'm not a technical person, but um, I love to work with Surti and help the community out. And one of the other things that happened since we started the, the, the worldwide community is that Surti has been translated in a lot of languages. We have already 12 languages within the system, languages you can download. And there are uh, some others in progress. Um, and if you want to help out, uh, maybe you can translate it in your own language. Um, so we have that language also. You can, on the uh, Xeta community website, you can see what, la what languages are in already. You can find that in the downloads part. I think that was what I wanted to tell you. Um, I don't know if there are any questions left. I see there's a lot of happening things happening in the in the chat. Maybe I can give you the word, Ron, to answering some questions or Julian. Thank you very much everybody for um, chipping in this afternoon and I hope everybody that's joined in come to find out a little bit more about the software has found that useful. <coughs> it's so brief and to try and pack in as much information as we can into these sessions and there's so much that we haven't spoken about today, particularly some of the more advanced features and um, we'll touch on some of those in the, in the chat there. Um, I hope some of you come to, to uh, Baltimore and come and join us on the Sunday where we can have some fun. Um, and we can go through some of the um, some of the more advanced stuff and show you some of the things that we've seen people do with the software that we never even imagined that people would use it for. I think that's one of the greatest pleasures I've taken from being involved in it is seeing people put the software to uses that never occurred to me. So thank you again for spending time with us this afternoon. Uh, we have got 10 minutes or so left um, and I'm happy to take any questions, but um, otherwise we're going to shut up and we'll save uh, Save it for Baltimore next time. Uh, last call on any more questions? If not, I think that's been a fascinating session. Thanks to everyone from Xerti and thanks to all our attendees. Uh, leave it a second just in case anyone thinks of something. Nope. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye.